Armageddon, let's talk about it, you know? <laughs> let's find out what it is. It's also not going to result in the end of the world, folks. It's not going to happen. Good afternoon, you're on the air. Hi, it's oh. Rita. Hi, Rita, how are you? Hi, I'm doing real good. Um, I just was going to tell you what I think, which is probably a lot different than a lot of people think, is I think it's uh, something that already happened. Okay, tell us about it. Uh, I just think that uh, it happened, it was talking about the first generation after Jesus was here when he said, many are standing here this day that will see me in my kingdom. You mean there's somebody out there that really read what he said instead of listening to what somebody said he said? <laughs> you mean you really did listen or, or read what Jesus said in the Bible? Yeah. Well, and, that's uh, amazing. You're probably one of only ten people in the world who ever did that. I've been told over and over that there are probably 80 million Christians living in this country alone. 80 million supposedly God-fearing, Bible-believing, church-going, rapture-anticipating Christians in the United States of America, and there's not enough power in the churches combined to make even the slightest of difference or change in this society in which we now live. Could it be, dear listeners, that these words have been twisted from their true meaning and then used against an unsuspecting and unknowing world in order to produce a generation that we are now seeing? But the religious leaders of the world would have us believe that the world's situation is the way it is because, and I quote, we are in the last days and we are seeing the fulfillment of Bible prophecy before our eyes, end quote. You see, they would have us believe that the evil that is so prevalent in the world is the way it is because God has willed it to be so. It's God's plan for the end times. We're led to believe that not only is there nothing that we can do about this world situation, but there is nothing that should be done because after all, it's Bible prophecy. But is it? Is it really Bible prophecy? Could you take your Bible and prove these things? Or can you only hope to parrot the supposed interpretations of this Bible prophecy that has been forced down your throat since the day you heard your first sermon? And they're all obsessed by this end-of-the-world message. And if they don't have a Bible in their hand showing you this message from the book of Revelation... There's an almost uncontrollable train of thought that people are bound to everywhere because of this end-of-the-world thinking. Now, is there any chance that this complacence could be exactly what the enemies of Christ have masterminded for ages? Is it possible that our complacency has occurred by design? I believe that it has. Now listen carefully. Jesus didn't say, Jesus, Jesus said unto them. He didn't say unto a future generation. He said unto them. Jesus said unto them. Remember, the disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily, I say unto you. There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, if it wasn't the temple of Christ's day, then what was it that they were supposed to be seeing? Could it be anything but the same temple? I find it impossible to believe that anything but the temple that was in existence in the day of Christ 2,000 years ago was the temple that was being referred to by Christ and his disciples in verses 1 and 2. But your preachers today tell you that it applies to the temple of today. And it's not true. Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? What? Paul told them that they would be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Do you understand what you just heard? Paul was telling them that their persecutions would end at the coming of Christ. And this was the hope that the Thessalonian church was looking for. This was what sustained their faith throughout all of the terrible persecutions that they were going through at that time. 
You see, Paul told them that they would be in Christ's presence at His coming. Now, was this just another in a long line of misrepresentations? How many did we cover Friday night? Reading verbatim from the Bible. Christ told them in Matthew 24 that they would be delivered up to be afflicted and to be persecuted. And the words are almost identical to those found in Matthew 24. In verse 4 he tells them, For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass and ye know. Now, it has to be noted that 1 Thessalonians was written during the same generation in which Christ spoke of in Matthew 24 when he said, in verse 34, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. He was talking to his disciples and he said, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Matthew 24 spoke of and I quote, the end of the world, end quote. And we discussed the true meaning of that word on Friday night in the original Greek translation. So let's look at this word world. The word world is a very interesting word when exhausted throughout Matthew 24. The word world appears three times in Matthew 24. And a simple study of those words shows that each time the word is used, it comes from a completely different Greek word, which gives it three different complete meanings. Each a completely different definition in the Greek. But you don't know that, because you're not supposed to know that. The first time it is mentioned is in verse 3, and it says, And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? The Greek word for world here is number 165 in the Greek Dictionary of Strong's and means eon. Eon, an age. They still talk about the end of the world and use that exact same phrase. But the Bible that they use doesn't even say it. Now, don't you find that interesting? The Bible that they use doesn't even say it. Listen to me very carefully. Listen to what I say. Listen to who Jesus is talking to. Verse 2 says this, And Jesus said unto them, See ye. Verse 3, The disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us. In verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. In verse 6, And ye shall hear of wars, see that ye be not troubled. In verse 9, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated. In verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. In verse 20, But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter. In verse 25, Behold, I have told you before. In verse 26, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert. Verse 32, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. In verse 33, So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. And in verse 34, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. I've gone through Matthew 24, and I've circled every time there's a word that describes who is talking and to whom the words are spoken, and it wasn't to anybody living today. It is overwhelmingly clear that Christ was talking to His disciples 2,000 years ago and not to some future generation some 2,000 years later. Why is it so hard to believe the Bible for exactly what it says? That the churches have also misrepresented the Bible in regard to the second coming of Jesus Christ. But folks, I revealed exactly what happened and when it happened and how it happened in my broadcast on Easter. So we find that Matthew doesn't relate the ascension at all. It's briefly mentioned in the appendix in Mark. And John barely suggests it. 
And then, in the form of a prediction, the only evangelist who describes it at any length is Luke. In chapter 24, verse 50, but this is because when he brings to a close his gospel, which is the story of Christ according to the flesh, he is already planning to follow it immediately with the story of the mystical Christ as well. His Acts of the Apostles are an episodic history of the church, and at the beginning of this new work, Acts chapter 1, verse 1 through 11, he repeats the story of the ascension with which he had ended his gospel. The ascension occurred on the Mount of Olives near Bethany, 40 days after the resurrection, since the apostles had left Jerusalem for Galilee no less than eight days after the resurrection, and were again in Jerusalem some time before the ascension, they must have stayed in Galilee less than a month. It is to this period that we must assign the other many appearances indicated in a general way by Paul and also by Luke when he says that the risen Jesus appeared to the apostles showing himself alive Quote, by many proofs, unquote, speaking to them of the kingdom of God and meeting habitually with them. Acts chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Undoubtedly, they had gone up to Jerusalem again at Jesus' bidding, and there they met for the last time. The risen master gave them his last instructions, among them that they were not to leave the city, but were to wait there for the promise of the Father, of which you have heard by my mouth, for John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. Acts chapter 1 verses 4 through 5. The promise referred to what took place shortly afterward on the day of the Jewish Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended upon them, but even at this last meeting with the risen Master, the apostles felt vaguely that something extraordinary was about to happen, and in their minds rose again the old messianic ideas so deeply rooted in their Jewish souls that they had survived in part even the realities of Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus' four official biographers do not go beyond the earth. Their narratives end with the ascension or just before it. Only the appendix of Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 19, casts a fleeting glance heavenward and states that Jesus was taken up into heaven and sits at the right hand of God. These last words, which proclaim that the man Jesus was associated in glory and power with the Heavenly Father, are especially dictated by the mind of the Church, and this mind, which has given us the four accounts of Jesus' early life, shrank from even a single narrative of his heavenly life, and has recorded only what would be its fundamental theme, quote, He sits at the right hand of God. Unquote. Good night, and God bless you all. Really, he's indicating that Jesus has already came, and the concept of a third coming and a third temple and the modern state of Israel is a fallacy, which is merely being used to make us believe uh, that our Messiah is coming back when these prophecies have actually been fulfilled uh, 2,000 years ago. With the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 28. Verily I say to you, there will be some standing here which shall not taste the death till they see the Son of Man coming into his kingdom. You know, some of them were still going to be alive when the Son of Man came into his kingdom by the end of that age, during that generation. Those of you, ladies and gentlemen, who believe so strongly in the book of Revelation in the King James Version of the Holy Bible and other religious and are superstitious people who believe in prophecies of Nostradamus and many others and think that you really have deciphered all of these things and you know exactly what's going to happen and when, you are being intentionally led into a state called Millennium Fever so that you will offer no opposition to the New World Order while you calmly await the workings of the hand of God and the arrival on this earth of whoever your particular Messiah happens to be. And oh, they're going to give you a Messiah. Oh, yes, they are. And we covered that in a previous episode. Your philosophy is you're not going to lift the favor no matter what happens. You're not going to do anything because you believe that it's all being brought about by the hand of God. 
and that you know this because you have read the inspired prophetic revelation of God. But apparently, and especially if you're a Christian, you don't even read or understand the teachings of the man you purport to follow. I see books all over the place purporting to be explaining to you what's going to happen in the near future. All telling you what I'm telling you, but telling you that you cannot resist it because it is the fulfilled prophecy, the prophetic revelation of God. Well, it's not. It's being brought about by flesh and blood men who are creating events to make you believe that it is the fulfilled prophetic revelation of God so that you will be rendered impotent, harmless. You will not lift a finger against what is coming. Remember what Jesus said, even the elect will be fooled. That is also repeated in the book of Revelations. Even the elect will be fooled. And I know that most of you think you're the elect, and I can tell you right now, you have definitely been fooled. 